please join me in welcoming Dr. Jesse M. Keenan. It's a great privilege uh, for me to be here uh, and learn. I've, I actually know a lot about Duluth, but surprisingly or not, uh, I've never been here before until Saturday. Um, and so it's been very humbling, uh, not only to learn about Duluth, but to learn from Duluth. And uh, tonight I'm going to maybe take us on a little bit of a journey in terms of one of those many climate futures um, and thinking about how Duluth can take advantage um, not necessarily entirely opportunistically, but thinking about sustainable urban development, thinking about migration and people on the move. And I'll tell you a little bit of an antidote in thinking about this. My wife and I flew into Duluth again, never been here before. So first of all, everything up tonight, let's take it with a little bit of grain of salt. Never been here before, right? Total outsider. I'm an East Coaster through and through. I'm sitting with my wife. Uh, we're eating our wild rice burgers uh, when we get here. Delicious, absolutely delicious. Needs the cheese, though. Um, my wife says, she looks at me, and first of all, my wife, New Yorker through and through, she's a tough cookie. Uh, we've traveled the world. She, she, you know, San Francisco's disconnected, LA's too slow. She's sitting there, she's eating, and she looks at me and she says, gosh, you know, I think I could live in Duluth. And, and all of a sudden, I, I get a panic attack, absolute panic attack. Uh, I said, wait a minute, this experiment has gone too far. Uh, I like Duluth too. Um, but if you could reach her, and I don't really think we understood the values of Duluth, but there was something intangible that we recognized. And it was, a, and it was something that uh, made me think that, you know, many people could recognize the value of Duluth. Um, not just us, and, and, and in fact, I don't think we are good for Duluth. You don't want my wife and I coming to Duluth. We're snobby East Coast elitists. Uh, we have a very particular taste in coffee, and we're not the kind of people you want to attract to Duluth. But in the future, there could be a lot of people on the move. We know flora and fauna are on the move. So let's talk about the idea of destination Duluth with the particular idea that this may not be a good idea, but let's at least start the conversation. Let's start a uh, central question here. Let's think about this because we're gonna start from descriptive research and move into things that are about design and normativity. That is how things ought to be. But let's start at least with some scholarly foundation conceptually and analytically. So for us, how can Duluth uh, market itself to uh, attract climates? Uh, climate migration and climate migrants and climagrants, as we'll use the language. And then what is Duluth's capacity to physically, economically, and socially adapt? And, and keep in mind, I'm leaving out a very important word here, which is environmental. And in many ways, that's a whole nother project, a whole nother lecture. And, and, and by all stretch of imagination, it's people here at the University of Minnesota, Duluth, the National Resources, Natural Resources Research Institute, who are the true experts. It's not my competency, but it's something that you should think of as an actual a huge gap and flaw in our, our thinking, but perhaps an opportunity moving forward. So let's start with terminology and thinking about how we can at least get on the same page conceptually. So human action and climate change, of course, we cause climate change. That's one component of it. But our response and preparation to climate change and climate change impacts can fall into one of two categories, climate mitigation. We understand this as reducing greenhouse gases, carbon, but in the, for instance, in California, there's 23 other gases that are traded on their uh, uh, GHG reduction scheme. But climate adaptation, this is my field. This is how we think about preparing and responding to climate change impacts. In the field of climate change adaptation, at least as it may formally register with the International Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, falls into two categories, resilience and transformative adaptation. So keep that in mind. There's a distinction between resilience and transformative adaptation. Now, resilience itself comes in multiple categorical variants. And along this continuum from engineering resilience to community resilience, we have the idea of single equilibrium to multi-equilibrium. So a single equilibrium is an elasticity to the operations of the status quo. It's a capacity to recover, to absorb and recover and return to functionality. And in that sense, it's about preservation, stability. But it's conservative. It's actually a fairly conservative concept. And community resilience is actually about multiple equilibrium. It's about a multiple stable state. But along this division, or this continuum rather, between objective and subjective, we can also think that on one end of the continuum with engineering re resilience is descriptive. Right? We can describe it, we can measure it, we can quantify that functionality, and particularly in engineering, it's extraordinarily well developed. Computer science, you get the blue screen on your computer and you turn it back on, that's engineering and engineering resilience at work because the software and the hardware are moving at two different paces. Community resilience is actually normative. It's how things ought to be. 
So we think about, generally, when we talk about engineering resilience, or we talk about resilience in sort of lay terms and the heuristics of it, it's really about engineering. But there's also ecological resilience. And this is a very valuable point. And in fact, in many cases, there's conflict between engineering resilience to serve anthropogenic ends and, engineering and environmental health. And that conflict between ecological and engineering resilience is a, is a strong point. There can be synergistic, of course, but it's also a point of contention. And community is really a very important component of it. It forces us to think about those norms and what ought to be, what is efficient, effective, fair, and just. And that's the role of community resilience conceptually and analytically. Now, we have to remember that we're human beings, and so we derive stability. We, we naturally seek stability, right? And we have some resilience functionality, even as a behavioral concept, right? We want to stabilize. We want to preserve. But at that threshold, resilience is only based on internal designs to known perturbations. There is a limit to resilience. There's a cost to resilience and adaptation, right? There's winners and losers, we can acknowledge that. But there's a fundamental limitation to resilience. And at that threshold of resilience, we either fail or we adapt. And that's the continuum that we have to think about. Because much of our existence, and as we, I see resilient this, we're resilient that, we're a resilient community, it's complete nonsense. And it's complete nonsense because it's pegged to the status quo, and we can acknowledge, I think, all of us to here today, that that's an unsustainable benchmark for the status quo. The challenge ahead of us, whether it's reducing our standard of living, engaging the environment, engaging social justice, is really about transformation. And that's going to bear costs, and that's something we all participate in, whether we like it or not. So the definition of adaptation is primarily oriented, and I think conceptually in our minds, it's oriented towards the negative effects. It's moderating the negative effects, right? And so we think a lot about this in a kind of optimization. In this case, an optimization on a frontier about average annual losses and investment, right? We're just trying to optimize. But you know that we can't optimize the environment, right? We know homostasis is the mind of theory. We can't optimize our lives and our relationships with people. Economics falls flat in that regard. There's winners and losers. But the other component of adaptation, which I think is a very strong component, is that it's not just managing risk. It's actually about taking advantage of opportunities. And this is our launching point for Duluth. It's not necessarily managing risks, and those are, are risks that will come, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But it's also about taking advantage of those opportunities. So let's just think, here's the proposition. In the future, people may be moving to Duluth because of climate change. They may be forced out, they may be driven out, they may have under their own elective mobility. So let's just think about this, because every time you think about adaptation, you have to think about resilience, and every time you think about resilience, you have to think about adaptation. And of course, what is maladaptive? That's always the specter behind it. So you have to think about actor orientation and time horizon, right? So adaptation to one person is undermining the resilience of another. Adaptation of another person at another scale is maladaptive to another. So you have to be precise in how you draw these analytical boundaries. So let's take three stakeholders. People who live in Duluth, people who are moving Duluth as climagrants, and the city of Duluth itself. So let's take a resident household. We have time horizon, it's the long term, maybe even multi-generational. The adaptation part is new forms of capital. It's new forms of social capital. But the maladaptive part is you may be crowding out people who live here. You may lead to things like climate gentrification. Ecological resilience, people may want to invest in the environment, right? New people may come in and they may actually provide more economic resources and more resources to support a sustainable management of the environment engagement. But the conflict here may be resource depletion. If we bring on and we pile on more people here, actually, Duluth's a wonderful city. I'm not sure we want to add more people here. There's resource depletion. And from a community right resilience point of view, we can repopulate. We'll talk about stagnation and population and demography in Duluth. So there's an opportunity, but there's also an opportunity for cultural conflict. And that's not easy. Ask people in Europe. Climate migrant household. It's adaptive. Well, their time horizon is the short term. It's less exposure, right? They're moving from a high-risk area to a low-risk area, a beautiful area. Um, and, but it may be maladaptive because they're giving things up. They're giving up social capital, relationships, assets, a home mortgage. Who knows? There's an amenity value. They may be incentivized to promote environmental investments, but they may be overwhelmed by the legacy pollution here. There's new social capital, cultural conflict, the same. For the city of Duluth, it's about bonds. It's about bond terms. It's annual tax assessments and increased tax base. But it may be maladaptive in the sense that there's new welfare burdens and new distributional benefit challenges. 
about how we capture that value and how we redistribute that value. And that's a fundamental governance challenge and it's a fundamental political challenge. But again, new forms of social capital, but we may also have existing resource competition that may impact our capacity and our adaptive capacity for community resilience. So here's our methodology. We start out with demography. We move into market segmentation and thinking about how that demography plays out in known units and quantities of markets and market demographics. We move into design research. We think about housing, housing life cycling. We move then into infrastructure and thinking about capacity analysis and what, absent environmental, because this is a huge gap here, and I want everybody to keep in mind that. It's a real limitation. And then we move into advertising and branding. How can we take these values, what, as us as outsiders, how, what we've interpreted the real values, and there's many values here, but how do we project Duluth to the rest of the world? So we have to start in a place of thinking that migration itself is a form of adaptation. We can't start this conversation here or anywhere else in the Northeast Minnesota region without thinking about the great story of the Ojibwe peoples and their own migration, the migration of the Dakotas as well. But Duluth was founded on environmental determinism, right? The very foundation of this city was based on its relationship to the environment. Oops. We know that it's about extraction. This is what you grew up with. For those Duluthians that grew up, your identity is caught up in the idea of extraction, environmental extraction, a legacy economy. But you've also come to know and appreciate the amenity values, the air-conditioned city. It's a beautiful shot. <laughs> so the struggle for the identity of Duluth is not in the idea of industries and what industries we bring back. Industries will never come back the way they were. People will never come back the way it was the past. It is mediated not by capitalism, but by human capital. And you have to really, I think, come to terms with it. First of all, it's not my decision. Don't even listen to me in this regard. But from an outsider, I understand that it's your determination, it's your democratic processes that are gonna drive this. And I'm at least giving you one of many options. So we know one of the major challenges about human investment in capital is actually about population. We've had 56 people from 2010 to 2016. <laughs> 56 people. Uh, per, going into 2040, 0.03%. So things are stable. Couldn't be more statistically stable. And listen, I was late yesterday for Soundtrack It. Tra uh, sound uh, check or whatever, and I was like, oh no, it's 4.35, I'm gonna hit rush hour, no rush hour. <laughs> Absolutely no rush hour. I got here in like five minutes, I was early. I was late and early at the same time. Uh, so we think in our discourse about climate refugees, right, popular news, it's the kind of imagery of how it is that people are negatively impacted. We think about climate refugees, and it's important. And in transmigration trans and internal displacement in the United States, it's a huge challenge for all of us. It's a huge challenge for national security. But we also think about displaced persons, right? That there's a chronic, it's, climate change is not episodic. It's about stress and shock together. It's an informally, even stochastically relationship between stress and shock in the built environment. But for us, I wanted to start at a slightly different place. And I think this is actually intellectually somewhat problematic because it, it leads to kind of social design and, and, and aspects of marketing and the kind of deep state of technology and, and manipulation that I think is quite sick in a reflection of how Silicon Valley has actually served a great disservice of misinformation. But maybe we can kind of think about how we utilize these tools of technology and understanding of who people are, maybe as, it, maybe as just consumers, but we can understand who these people are and see what, how can we attract them? What about Duluth connects with them? And for formally, these are the people of elective mobility. It isn't to the exclusion, absolutely, of climate refugees or displaced persons. Those people will come. But how do we jumpstart the process? How do we jumpstart that process with not just human capital, but also financial capital? So let's start in the general realm of climate demography, at least as a former scholarly endeavor. This is the work of Matt Hauer, a professor at Florida State University. What you see here are two different maps, slight deviation in modeling as it, associates, as it relates to adaptation. But what you see here are these South Florida, Louisiana, the Carolinas, DC, uh, what's not well represented here actually is here, New Jersey. These are areas that are on the move. Who's gonna benefit? 
Austin, Orlando, Atlanta. Actually, we don't think Atlanta. We think Atlanta because of freshwater is this is an incorrect set of assumptions, or let's say a flawed set of assumptions. Um, who's losing it? Miami, New Orleans, New Jersey. M Miami's losing a lot. This is southeastern states. This is Florida. This is the interaction based on IRS tax records and a number of sort of formal things. Minnesota doesn't even show up in this. <laughs> Yet. Yet. So what are some other considerations that we can think about? Well, with climate change, we have to think about this in the context of the great American migration slowdown. The history of America is actually, well, there's many histories of America, we should first acknowledge that. But one of the histories of America is that people move where the jobs are, right? And the reason we've slowed down is multifold. We don't actually move as much. There's mortgage debt, there's student loan debt. I had to bring that up here. Although this is a great university, you can get a great education for probably very little. And that's actually a huge attraction, trust me. There's debt, there's dual income, there's technology. There's a number of things that slowed us down. So the question is, will climate change migration speed up what is a broader trend that's been slowing down in climate migration or just general migration? So we have to think about uh, formal retreat. So the people that are actually going to be dislocated, particularly as it relates to sea level rise, and I just want to go back and remind us, if I didn't explicitly say so, that Howard work, that map you saw in the United States, that's just sea level rise. That's not even accounting for forest fires, for drought, for heat, um, potable water shortages. There's people in California right now that if you, your well runs dry, your house gets condemned, your, uh, your mortgage gets foreclosed. It's a, it's, it, you're out of a house and you can't continue to drill. So if we're thinking about disasters and disasters sort of episodically drive population shifts, there's some limitations because one, it advantages and it biases the wealthy, the property owners, the whole system is oriented around property rights and homeowners in particular. They disproportionately benefit from disaster aid. It's, it's well understood empirically at this point. There's also another consideration, which is there's a mismatch. So those states that are sending, let's say Florida and South Carolina, they're pretty old and they're pretty young. There's not a lot in the middle. But states like California and New Jersey are actually likely going to be sending, or we could argue that they would be sending, a fair amount of young productive people. And that's the balance. What that balance is, that's not for me to determine. But we at least give it some consideration. Now, another component of this in terms of research and demography is that climate change is likely going to um, uh, reduce our fertility rates. And this is a huge problem in the United States. I actually saw the other day in Europe some women were going on a birth strike. They were no longer going to have babies until climate change was over. It's going to be a long wait. <laughs> but, 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 reduction in fertility rates is bad for our overall economy, but it may actually be good for children because some scholars have thought, well, with fewer children, we may actually be able to give them more resources and may be able to get a better education. And from another point of view, we can think that as households perhaps get smaller, we can think about less consumption. And we can think about this as an opportunity to lessen our footprint, to have a smaller footprint, to think about sustainable urban development. So what's, cli what's the loose climate light going to be in a place like 2080 and or something like a high emission scenario? First of all, who knows? We, we have certain degrees, but the degree to which one could downscale this uh, is, is much for discussion, not for me to speak to. There's recent research um, out of the University of Maryland. It suggests that under this high emissions scenario uh, uh, in 2080 or by 2080, it's some approximation of these areas. Probably the closest approximation is somewhere around Toledo, Ohio. I think disregard the moisture, the rain precipitation thing. I actually think this is quite wrong, but the temperature is really what you should focus it on. So it's going to be warmer. It's going to be something very similar to Toledo, very moderate climate in the future. At least this is an argument we're going to make. So why is climate important when people are making decisions? Well, one thing that has been evaluated in economics is that climate is an amenity where you can walk to, restaurants, walkability, schools, right? One of the primary determinants about where people move, particularly young families, school system, right? Makes fair sense. It's one of many amenities. But climate, as it turns out, and people's perception of future climate is also an amenity that goes into decision making. And we can understand this as a marginal willingness to pay, right? A willing, how are you really willing to pay to preserve your climate? And with that, it's anticipated that marginal effect becomes stronger with climate change. Now, what we see here is a moderate uh, emission scenario, uh, and we have a high emission scenario. And what you see under the moderate emission scenario is that people in Northeast, um, they could kind of take it or leave it, their climate. That's just the way Northeasters are. They think it's cold. They're ready to move. So this is actually a positive. But what you see down here 
and then order about $2,500, and here about $3,000. That's the amount of money that they're willing to spend to perpetuate the climate that will likely exist at that time. And what that really means is, well, that's somewhat independently interesting, but $3,000, as it turns out, is nothing. It's a very small amount of money. So the implications here are, and I wouldn't draw too grand of implications from this, but one implication from this is that climate is important people. People who live in the sunshine state, they love the sunshine, but they don't love it that much. They're willing to pay maybe $3,000 for that, which makes me think that, well, Duluth, it's beautiful here. And in fact, there may be a comparable substitute in terms of climate and environment. And if $3,000 is all we're talking about, maybe it's not of as strong as a draw or as strong of an amenity as we like to think about. So Duluth, Minnesota, plenty of things on the horizon. It's getting warmer and wetter. We know this wonderful lecture last night. Um, that rain is gonna bring all kinds of problems in terms of sedimentation, in terms of toxic pollution, diffusion, and the like. Um, it's gonna be hot here, but not the kind of heat that we're talking about that necessarily impacts uh, public health. Although. I gotta admit, we have to recognize that part of your own adaptation in the future is buying air conditioners. And those air conditioners are gonna consume a lot of energy, right? So adaptation at one scale, maladaptive at another, right? That'll be part of your own, your own adaptation. So let's think about this and step back. And so people are willing to pay, what, why didn't people move? But let's just remember that we're part of a broader ecosystem. And that range migration is a phenomenon. Flora and fauna are on the move in the northern hemisphere moving north. Temperature, fecundity, reproduction, it's all highly sensitive to temperature. Not always, but in many cases. They mean compelling research on this. And so why would humans be any different? So in the northern hemisphere, you're moving north. In the southern hemisphere, you're moving south. And I love this example. This is the wild turkey in the year 2000. And this is the range of the, mild, uh, the wild turkey in the year 2000. And this is it going into... 2080, right? This is a huge rain shift. You're moving all the way into Alaska, right? That's an amazing rain shift. Are people going to do what the wild turkey is going to do? Are we all just a bunch of turkeys? <laughs> so the idea of American liberalism and the concept of the Western expansion for as corrupt as it is, is deeply embedded in our minds. But will it really be about Northern expansion? This is a tribe in Louisiana who's actually just turned down about $35 million from the federal government to relocate. They're, they're going down with the ship. It's all they have ever known. So why Duluth? Fresh water, low cost of living. The legacy economy that you do have is artificial intelligence free. You're doing stuff that robots can't do. There's strong health care, amazing health care. There's a great education system, including UMD. There's cheap energy, relatively cheap energy, and the energy that you're getting is increasingly coming from renewable sources. We have representatives here tonight. We have a wonderful legacy, a lot of mistakes along the way, a lot of emerging successes in terms of environmental research and development. And you're part of, I know it, you hate to admit this, but you're part of the Minneapolis-St. Paul idea of, a, of an urban economy. I know it's terrible to say. But why not Duluth? So you have, stru you have structural poverty, and among that poverty, there's many people who are quite disabled. You have legacy pollution. There's no escaping it. There's a kind of nativism here. People are awfully nice in Minnesota, but if you had 100,000 New Yorkers come, you could talk about an all-out revolt. <laughs> there's a suburban mall culture. Your idea of this city is stuck out at the mall. You don't shop downtown as much. You have a, probably an over-reliance in retail and hospitality in your labor sector. You have some serious regional governance challenges. A lot of little small towns, Duluth itself is relatively small. And you have some, some significant deferred maintenance challenges. <laughs> I didn't even know that one was funny, but I'll take it. <laughs> well, okay, okay. We can start with one place. Uh, uh, having never been here. Let's start with the roads first. Uh, it's, it's like Ireland. They get you when you get in the rental car and you have, you're supposed to upgrade the tire package for like three times the cost of the car. It's a total scam. So let's think about climate mobility and let's think about those market segments and how we break this down. Now, we went a certain way about where we were going with this, but this is where you all pick up or don't pick up. This may not be a good but so we went and we thought about, okay, there's three life stages that we really want to take on. One is younger years. People are productive. They're earning college. Uh, their earnings are great. 
They're adding stuff to the economy. And best of all, they don't have children yet, so they're not drawing down on the tax base. This is how New York survives. You don't realize this. Many large cities survive on highly productive young people. They eat them up. They chew them out. And when they're ready to have kids, they move to Denver. <laughs> Family life. People who are looking for a good education, a safe place to live. This is a key component of our economy. And then mature years. People who are still semi-productive, who are working, who want to be engaged, who want to be part of a community. We know that it's well represented here. So let's take younger years. We have, and this is, there are dozens of market segments. This is coming from Nielsen Prism. We just picked a few that we thought, meh, why not? Now there's a deeper logic here, but we picked a few and we said, let's think about where these people are and line this up with where we think people are coming from, particularly from sea level rise. So let's take up and comers, okay? These are pretty wealthy, $68,000 household income on average. Um, above average housing technology, college graduates, advanced professionals, they own a Volkswagen, they eat at Cadova, they shop at Express, they take continuing education courses, great for UMD, um, they fly Southwest, they watch Hulu, and they listen to Urban Contemporary. I can't vouch for the Urban Contemporary, I'm more of a Paul Simon person myself. But this is where they are, and as it winds up, Southern California, South Florida, and New Jersey, pretty well wind up here, actually. There are significant numbers of these people in this market segment in these areas that are going to be on the move in the future. Family life, we picked a few. Country squires, fast track families, big sky families, campers and campers. You guys may not all this, but every time you sign on to the internet somewhere, you're getting classified in one of these things. I know how much toilet paper and what kind of toilet paper everybody in this zip code buys. <laughs> Fast track families, median income, now we're talking about much more wealth. And again, when we're talking about this, we have to think about, well, what's the alternative? Who are the people that are not captured here? On one end of the distribution, um, those who may not have the resources or the capacity of those that may be trapped. So there's, a, there's some limitations to this kind of thinking, this methodology. They own a Subaru, they eat at Texas Roadhouse, um, they shop at Dick's Sporting Goods, they go hunting, they fly Frontier, they watch ESPN and they listen to New Country. I'm pretty sure I saw all of these people out near Miller Mall the other day. I saw all of them, <laughs> all at the same time, and they were driving trucks. Good luck with that. Fast tracks, okay, not so much in Florida, but you see this in New Jersey. It's very heavy in Jersey, and check it out. Everybody's moving to Denver, just like I said. Denver and, and Austin have been huge success stories. It's where the jobs are, it's cheap, it's an open culture. In many ways, it's many of the similar attributes that I think Duluth has. Mature years, upper crust, movers and shakers, monies and brains and gray power. The names are ridiculous. Now we're really talking about a quite amount of wealth. They own Cadillacs, they eat a bonefish, shop at Chico's, they visit Alaska, they watch the Golf Channel get out of here, but redeeming one redeeming quality, they listen to classical music. I'll take that. I often judge a town by the quality of their jazz and classical music radio station. Go on. Okay, Gray Power, this is where they are. Um, no doubt, all of those snowbirds down in South Florida and Arizona. And by the way, hot as hell in Arizona. Who's going to want to live there in the future? Uh, these people are on the move as well as New Jersey. Market segments, New York, Atlanta, D.C. This is, this is 4 million people we're talking about. Just these segments that I showed you, just those limited segments. Um, add up to 4 million people. When you look at this at a composite, it lines up quite well with New Jersey, Atlanta, uh, parts of coastal Texas, Houston, South Florida, Arizona, and Southern California. It lines up quite well. Now let's just take Florida, for example. High concentrations in Florida. If you're looking at about 490,000 people you could potentially market to, um, to come to Duluth. Right? Miami Metro alone, um, just the market segments I showed you, this is not by any means a fully representative sample is at 317,000 people, slightly older age at 52 and 57 respectively. But let's take, this is actually real life. People are actually doing this. This is the Jacksons. They lived in Seaside, Florida. Beautiful view. Um, tor um, tornadoes and hurricanes. BP oil spill, lack of infrastructure. Um, driving to the, the the, the grocery store went from 10 minutes to two hours. They said, you know what, Florida, we're done with it. We're moving to Minnesota. We're buying snowmobiles. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully health insurance to go along with those snowmobiles. Because it turns out those things are pretty dangerous. So what kind of place do people want to live in, right? So if we think about, okay, these are the people on the move, or maybe these are the people on the move. You know, where do they want to live? Or how do they want to live? And it's about accessibility. It's about being authentic. And it's about affordability, right? So accessible, authentic, and affordable. And we have to think about places for people, right? And then actually, Duluth has a tremendous legacy of urbanism 
in this regard, a huge capacity. You have a wonderful legacy of innovative transportation. This is the incline connecting to the trolley. I'm telling you, you walk those hills enough, you're gonna wish the incline was back. <laughs> of course, with innovation comes failure. I don't know if you know, guys know this, but this is the actual moment that incline caught on fire before it crashed into the station, and that was the end of the incline. It's a wonderful photo. But the idea is that we have this mass transportation, right down Superior Street, mass transportation. But it's cars, we start losing our sidewalk. This is the story of America, right? And as we have more cars and more cars, our idea, Kevin Lynch's image of the city, we become more removed from it all. And this is what we're left with, right? This is our image of the city. So there's 158 people in this photograph. If you can find 158 people that on a non-parade day in Duluth downtown, I would be impressed. <laughs> so there's good bones here architecturally in terms of urban design. These are fundamentally authentic places. And there's authentic people. I don't know if you guys know who this is. This is Aquaman, Lake Superior Aquaman, quite impressive. This is Shinobi. This is Rachel Kilgore. These are people who are contributing to the culture and advancement and the arts and the lifeblood of this city. And when you think about preservation, when you think about the capacity for preservation in Duluth, it's about people. It's about demand. I, I tell you, I drive around with my real estate hat on. It's a severe conflict of interest, of course. But I drive around and I look at these buildings and they're beautiful. It's beautiful architecture here, many places. And you have to give credit um, to a number of different entities, including, I believe, the Alliance for Historic Preservation here in Duluth. Um, it's notable work and it's, it may be the lifeblood of your city in the future. So there's 158 people here, but what would it look like with 10,000 people? What would it look like with 100,000 people? So we begin to think about Duluth and we begin to find our orientation. Of course, this is flattened out for our own representational convenience. We begin to find our own place markers. What's the infrastructure? What's the social infrastructure? What's the physical infrastructure that drives Duluth? And we begin to say, well, we take on a very simple hypothesis. What if these 10,000 people that move here were going to live in a highly accessible, mass transit-driven, high-density environment that harkens to the legacy of the loose past? And what would that look like? As we see, we begin to move in from the historic district, moving into what I think will be a very robust healthcare district in the future. You can think about low-rise, this isn't about architecture, it's actually urban design, how we fit interstitially within the block. And you think about the impacts. Well, at 10,000 people, that, first of all, who knows when people may come, if they come at all. I think they perhaps will. But over the course of 50 years, assuming a straight line amortization, that'd be 204 people a year, right? That's a fair amount of people. It's more than you got in the past near decade. <laughs> and that's a lot of square footage. It's 7 million square feet. It's not inconsequential. Um, and if you were going to take impact fees, and what we call impact fees are we went through and said, how many firefighters are you going to need? How many school uh, teachers are you going to need? How many deaths are you going to need? How much what, stormwater infrastructure? Parks and recreation. What's the urban service delivery standard for parks and recreation? And on a per capita or per square or whatever that impact may be, we monetize that in present value terms, in 2017 present value terms, and we think about, well, this is something that we would extract out of the development process to help pay for all of this, right? Legally, you take that on in your own time. But if we add up our tax revenue on an annualized basis, if 204 people moved here, that would add an additional 1.54% every single year to your tax rolls. And we went through multiple tax bases. We went through consumer, consumption, hotel, you name it. We went through the whole thing. These are not precise numbers by any means. This is just an order of approximation, right? We're just trying to get ballpark here. So we think, okay, at 20,000, what does this look like? And by the way, we immediately, and this is my, oh, I, I hate to impose, but that rad <laughs> the Radisson is terrible. The Radisson's got to go. So we tear down the Radisson, of course. This is the only thing, this is my guilty pleasure. I tear down the Radisson. I reimpose Daniel Burnham's wonderful civic master plan, right? It's a one, and the library, whoever does, it's a brilliant design. The library going into the train station, lifting up on the pillow tees. It's wonderful design. We get rid of the Radisson. We open it all the way up, right? It's core. It's fundamental. It's all the things are there. The Radisson ruins it. We get rid of it. So at 30,000, you begin to see the infill density. At 40,000, it becomes quite urban in many ways. This would be an annualized square footage of about 500,000 square feet. Of course, economic cycles, there's all kinds of shocks that may happen, intervening storms, there's all kinds of things. Who knows what the timing may be? 
50,000. We begin to, at 50,000, we actually think in terms of ridership, we can actually bring a tram back in down Superior Street. I think it's actually quite reasonable. Make an investment in the uh, architecture of the train station. Listen, the train's coming from Minneapolis. The people from MSP are coming whether you like it or not. Um, and this really begins to take on, uh, take off in many ways. I think independent of whether people move here in terms of climate migration or whatever, the hospital district is poised for a tremendous amount of growth uh, in the future. And I think that's probably a, probably a good thing. So we begin to think about mid-rise intensity development. Uh, and again, at 50,000, this is a significant impact. If we were to, again, straight line amortization, that's 1,000 people a year moving to Duluth. Again, we're on the verge of civil disorder at that point, of course. Um, but that's a 7.7, .7, you know, about 7% annual tax increase. That's a lot of money coming in. It's perhaps a lot of opportunity one way or the other. Um, we have to think about this value capture, of course, and then think about, listen, this isn't just new development. We have to think about affordable housing. We have to think about the people we're displacing. What percentage of that new development, that new housing, that new value creation, the new retail is supporting mom and pop, is supporting people who are displaced through this whole process, who have been gentrified out, right? So it isn't just we collect money and it's a development-driven proposition. We have to think about Duluthians today and Duluthians tomorrow. So at 80,000, it starts to become quite ridiculous, of course. And at 90,000, uh, and I want to say that one of the things I was really impressed with, I think is quite wonderful, um, of course, having never been here, you, you look at the railroad and you look at the interstate and you think that it divides you from the lake, but actually it's wonderful urban design and how you bridge that and bring people to the lake. It's very impressive. At 100,000, we're really talking quite a significant expansion of, of the hospital district in particular, probably north of 1,000 beds. Uh, and this is the kind of high density and uh, high intensity development you think about. Had dinner the other night, and there was a gentleman there, who was an ornithologist, and was, he was saying, you know, with all these new glass buildings and things, we're losing all these birds. They're flying right into it, right? So there are externalities. There's costs. There's an environmental footprint to this kind of thing. It's not just absolute. You know, there's some function here, of course, of real estate greed, and there's some advancement of affordable housing, but it's it's conflicting values and conflicting missions, and that's for you all to decide. And of course, the numbers here are quite extreme. So as you think about what this means, this intensity of development, is this, is this historicizing the past? Is this kind of nostalgic thinking? I don't know, but I feel like when I'm here, the capacity is there. So we wanted to take that thinking, and quite frankly, I'm going to be quite serious here. I do not think that even from tonight, it would not surprise me if 10 or 20,000 people moved to Duluth. It would not surprise me at all. So the question is, how do we connect with people? And how do we connect with people in particular geographies, in particular market segments? How do we engage them? Well, we engage in this case as an exercise in research, or in this case, marketing research, through ideas of imagery and branding. We ran ads on Facebook. We targeted these people in Florida. We want to understand what connected with them, what ideas connected with them, who clicked on what. I just want to go back with this one. This is an easy bait for the internet. Top 10 reasons why people are moving to Duluth. <laughs> First of all, if any of you can tell me 10 reasons at all, I'd feel pretty good. Uh, I may only have one or two. Most of it's water uh, driven. Um, people clicked on this and we started to understand who was connecting with what, what connected with people. So we have a lot of different slogans, a lot of different ideas. Home, no matter where you're from, this is important. Actually, I think there's a historical legacy. Duluth. <laughs> Not as cold as you think. And let me tell you, when we, we focus groups of people from Florida and the whole thing, they're really worried about this. They're really worried about, hey, upside of climate change, in the winter, at night, it's not going to be as cold. So Duluth, not as cold as you think. Of course, we found out there's a killer surfing scene here. What we didn't tell the people in Florida is this happens in the winter only. <laughs> so people in Florida are a little gullible sometimes. So we begin to take on this idea of climate proof. Now, it's ridiculous. No city can be climate proof. No place is concrete. No one's immune from climate change. But we begin to play on this and build in these color and the saturation, the infinite horizon that people connect with from one coast to the other. It also, I think, resonates on a lake as well. The most climate-proof city in America, you've done it, Duluth. This is your identity. <laughs> this is it, the most climate-proof city in America. You have that, actually, opportunity to provide that kind of leadership. Sort of, <laughs> right? For my climate scientist friends and my colleagues, of course, sort of a necessary qualifier. 99% climate proof, right? So we, we have to have fun with this, right? And this is part of how it works. This is where it really gets fun. Texas. <laughs> Don't get left behind, move to Duluth. Now this is a really good one because people fear getting left behind in technology, actually. 
And in fact, if you look at, um, and this is a fear that's actually greatly impacts our labor economy in many ways. For instance, many women uh, after um, their childbearing years actually find that one of the most difficult challenges is to get back into their job and move up in their jobs is because of technology and their inability to keep up with technology. It's a huge drain. It's also a huge component of our psyche or our kind of, uh, our kind of mental model of how we engage the world. So we, we took advantage of this. <laughs> Florida, remember when Facebook was a thing? Because at one point in time, Facebook was a thing. It's no longer a thing now, right? If the younger folks in here should know what I'm talking about. I, my students had to tell me, of course. So what does this mean to begin to engage the outside world and to think about how do we connect with people? Sure, on social media, but in the real world. You know, I myself have sat at a bus stop and it's been cold as hell sitting in New York City on a bus stop and I see an ad for Fort Lauderdale. And all of a sudden in my head, Fort Lauderdale doesn't sound so bad. How can Duluth connect with people in these minds? How can we engage with people? Is it a game? Is it part of something that connects us with other people? And of course, we have to troll our neighbors to the south, right? <laughs> Why would we do anything short of taking advantage of this? We do know that young people, somewhat anecdotally, I think we're getting some better information, um, that there are definitely young people from MSP that are buying up here. Um, it's hard to understand how or why they're doing that. But anyway, I just want to say, listen, this is a team, um, a, a great team of people that work with me on this. Alex Stefano, Don O'Keefe, Andrea Hoxha, Sam Atkinson, Jennifer kaplan Mora, Barry Garland, Sydney Pedrigo, Rujan Xian. It's a great team. There's a lot of people who went into this thinking. And so we, I want to end with one thing, which is this. We, just, we heard that you were looking for new flags. So we started thinking about, okay, we've done all this work. Think about branding. What can we do to bring you a new flag? It's probably no good. We really like this one because we know you guys love that bridge. You love it. It's in every shot. I'm sure it's like etched into someone's coffin because um, people love that bridge. So we said, okay, we'll give you your bridge. We thought about something maybe a little bit different. Right? We said, well, here's the bow of a ship or a canoe. Here's a pin on a map. Duluth is a place, a place that people I think will recognize, if only rhetorically from our night tonight. It's a water drop, one of your greatest resources, but it's the infinite horizon of Lake Superior. And I think this in many ways, it represents, it's maybe iconographic for us, but it's a, it's a map. You may not like it, take it or leave it. So the question I leave you all with is, this is a climate friendly city. It's not for you to decide, it's not for me to decide. You have new neighbors, there's new people, new teachers, new friends. It's a whole new way of life that may be upon you whether you realize it or not. And that may resonate in terms of cultural conflict, it may bring good and the bad, but it's really for you to decide. Because one day you yourself may be sitting somewhere and you may see this ad. But thank you very much for having me Duluth. <laughs>